Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Welcome to the podcast. In this podcast episode, I talk with Ed Hajum about not being a victim to your circumstances and building resilience to overcome challenges. Ed, hey, Jim, welcome to the conversation today, among many, many others. And Ed, anything you would like to highlight from your own background or personal context before we dive on in? Uh, just that, I, that I've written my books because I want to communicate to people that anything is possible. I, I grew up in, in orphanages and foster homes with essentially no parents. And I get to describe my early life as no one came to any of my graduations from mm. grammar school to graduate school. Uh, and I believe very strongly that education is the solution to everything. And you hit something that I really believe in is that basically try never to be a victim. The energy in using you use being a victim basically drains the energy required to figure out what's next. And what's next is the answer to most problems. I could go on for quite a bit of time because I spent my first 18 years in 18 to 20 different places. And yeah. the, the, the concept of resilience is like a muscle and I got a chance to build that muscle and it really helped me throughout life and, and I believe the disadvantages I got in the early life actually became a lot of them became advantages later on yeah so how you respond to that adversity really does shape your future and it, it shapes the growth and you know the potential future opportunities that may come your way uh, and, and so again we don't want to downplay or diminish the harm that may have been done to any listener, um, right? Like people deal with harm, people are abused, they are exploited, um, taken advantage of. All of those things are very real. The, that's not the point. The point is recognizing that, yes, we are in a very messy, complex world where bad things happen. Pretty much everyone deals with those bad things. And so the question really is, how are you going to respond to the hard things that are faced that you're faced with? And your comment about just, using up your energy around being a victim again you may very well absolutely be a victim of sexual abuse or uh, or other sorts of uh, exploitation or abuse but if we're if we spend so much energy ruminating on and living in the past in those types of uh victim experiences then we're using up our well and our storage of energy that is limited uh, and and we're not going to be as as well positioned to move forward in into our future. So I love the idea of just like let's let's learn what we can learn from the bad experiences we face, and then let's use them as a springboard. You know, sometimes we talk about the metaphor of a stepping stone instead of a you know an obstacle. It's a stepping stone to the future. Let's use it as a springboard into the future, so that now we're we're ready to face the new challenges that come our way. And I, I even make the statement that early failure and actually early abuse is sometimes an advantage because of the fact you do get a chance to build up. You find out people that grow up in good communities and are never have a problem later on in life have great anxiety because they never had a chance, never had been challenged. In fact, some of my very close friends, well, obviously, you know, I've grown up, we, our kids grew up in a very nice community. They said, what can I do with my children? I said, make them uncomfortable. Give them challenges. Stress them a bit. It's healthy. Because once you get over that, you gain a self-confidence that next time you come up with that, that boogeyman or boogie woman, you can handle it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of your own past? You talked about being in the foster system. Um, I know in your book, you talk about some of the different types of things that you faced, but how you were able to stay positive and resilient and forward thinking. Why don't you walk us through some of those challenges that you faced? Well, if, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it reads almost like fiction. Uh, my father and mother got divorced when I was three. 
Uh, she got custody, moved me from St. Louis, from Los Angeles to St. Louis, where her parents were. My father got visiting rights on Sunday. He arrived. He drove 1,800 miles in his Ford Roadster, picked me up, decided he wasn't going to take me to a movie, but he took me back to Los Angeles to cover my book shows, Highway 66. When along the way, he told me my mother passed away. And, uh, you know, that was the end of that. I mean, I thought that was the case for better than 57 years. And uh, unfortunately, he was drafted or volunteered to go into the Second World War, which started in Nigeria, a trip for me through five foster homes in Los Angeles, starting with one which was almost Dickinsonian. It was a cold and, and abusive. And to the last one, which was warm and caring. Unfortunately, the last one was only six months. Father wanted me back after the war was over. We ended up in the YMCA on 34th Street for the summer of 47, then a hotel room in Coney Island. And again, he couldn't get land-based work, so he went back to sea as a, a merchant marine radio operator, and I ended up in two orphanages. Uh, the first one was uh, for young young people, and at age 15, I aged out, and my father totally disappeared. I, laid, I didn't find out why he disappeared for almost 50 years, but he disappeared. I became a ward of the state and could have been sent any place, but they sent me to another very good orphanage, which was uh, about four blocks from an excellent high school in Yonkers, New York. And I got an epiphany at age 15. I saw the light, basically. I said, if I can go to a private college, I'll, I'll get out of this thing. And mm -hmm. uh, I worked my tail off on both the, on the athletic field and in the classroom, got a scholarship, and it changed my life. And so, therefore, I've dedicated all of my, well, most of my philanthropy toward that little critical period between 16 and 21 for kids that basically get through the difficult situation like I did and just yeah. need some funding to take the next step. Yeah. Well, in education as a way out of a hard background, a hard situation, I, I think that's something that we really do need to highlight. Now, I'm a university professor. Um, you know, I do consulting stuff as well. But, I, you know, first and foremost, I'm a university professor. And I believe strongly in the power of education, the, the power to transform lives and to enhance someone's socioeconomic status and standard of living and all of those sorts of things. So much can happen through education, even when people are dealt a really bad hand early in life. It is the great equalizer. And uh, you know, George Eastman said that education is the solution to almost everything. I've added it is the solution to everything. And by the way, education should take many different forms. One of the things yeah. that I've become a big proponent of is what they call vocational education, which yeah. I've changed the word professional education, nurses, marine engineers, the public yeah. safety officers, the hospitality workers. I'm involved in a, in a golf club in Nantucket, and we give two scholarships a year for the last 15 or 20 years. And about five years ago, we started giving vocational scholarships. And last year, we gave 15 of these. We changed them to professional scholarships. And it's wonderful to see a young man who wants to be a chef who couldn't possibly afford Johnson Wells at $60,000 a year. And we give him that scholarship. And it changed his life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And to no, your no, point... It, 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 to your point, it takes lots of forms. So traditional four-year university degrees is one way, and it works for some people, depending on your career path or goals or ambitions. But um, certifications, vocational or professional types of upskilling, reskilling um, certificates, et cetera, there's lots of different things that can help people. Uh, and so no, certainly no one size fits all. But yeah, for anyone who's looking at you know maybe their stage in life and thinking, man, I'm not quite where I want to be, where you recognize, yeah, I've dealt with a lot of hard things, a lot of hard knocks. Uh, how do I move forward? Or you know people in your life that have experienced that, or perhaps you have people in your organization or who are dealing with that. Um, you know, there are so many different paths forward through education to help people uh, be prepared for their that that wonderful future that lays in store for them. And you know, that's one, you know, again, I don't want to pitch my book too hard, but that's one of the things I really want to take to the universities and to all the schools. I want kids, young people to seek their passion and also their talents, their interests, their, you know, what they can do and can't do, but also the context. You can't, if you're in Ukraine, it's different than being in Greenwich, Connecticut. But I want, my, my book, I want to press young people early in their life to figure out what they want to do and how they, they're going to get there. And I think that will change quite a bit. And when someone's passionate about being a, a police officer or being a nurse, that's just as important as being a physicist. And, you know, you have to judge everything. But I, that's why I'm pitching everybody that education has to add another 
leg to itself, which is to give young people a chance to not only gain techniques, gain capabilities, gain the ability to think and to work it, which is now the job the universities do pretty well, but also give these kids the idea that they're unique and that they have to figure out what they personally are really interested in and to start to, to plan that physically. I mean, to write it down, to figure out what their passions are, what their talents are, what their principles are, what kind of partners they need, and finally to write that down as plans. Maybe they write it down in pencil as freshmen in college so they can erase it as they go along, as I did. But it's very important that you do those things early on and the universities communicate that you as an individual are unique. And that's why I decided on a life design course, which we started at Rochester, New York, University of Rochester, where I went. And I'm trying to pitch that as much as I can. And I think a freshman taking that kind of a course will have a chance to really say to himself, you know, this university is used to me, not only to train me, but me as a person. Yeah, very good. Well, and and I'm curious, you know, lots of people, again, as I've said, everyone has their stuff. Everyone has their messy background yeah, and history, right. <laughs> right? But not everyone responds the way you did. So I'm I'm wondering, what do you think helped you to overcome, build resilience, pull through in your um, challenging circumstances? And what kind of lessons are there, I think, for others uh, who might, you know, feel, be feeling despair, or be feeling like just overwhelmed with life? Three things, and, and it's writing the book, basically, and having people like you ask me that question. If I've dug into it. I don't have the whole answer. But first of all, everybody has to have a mentor. You know, my, my, one of my ghostwriters wanted me to hate my father. I did not hate my father. I loved him because he always said, you're a great person. You're going to do well. He was there in writing. He was there, you know, with letters and so forth. So, and I, I've, I've studied this, that kids that have mentors, somebody they can talk to and who will support them. Then I also felt I didn't have any mentors, but I look back in my life, I did. The, the, the fellow at the last orphanage was very much behind me. I mean, I didn't take his advice very well because I was independent. I didn't trust anybody. But looking back, he was always there for me. He always said, you're going to make it. You're going you're gonna to do well. Then, of course, in college, my, my mechanical drawing professor, who got me through the first year and so forth, and spent, stayed four years. He was a mentor. So have a mentor. That starts with number one. Number two, I was very lucky. Sounds kind of corny, but I was in five different Catholic schools, and the nuns taught something that you, you just was straight ahead. You know, if you did the right thing, you ended up in that wonderful place, and if you did the wrong thing, you ended up in the other place. And they also taught you my, what I call the most important rule, which was the golden rule, and they taught it with the golden ruler. They basically taught you will, you know, pay attention to other people. You will basically do well. And then kind of in a sort of corny fashion, looking back and trying to answer that question you asked me, the movies in those days, mm -hmm. the good guys always did pretty well. You know, the John Waynes, the, the Jimmy Stewart's and so forth. And every Saturday, that was a ritual for kids like me, take 10 cents and go to the movies and see these people on the screen. So those are the three things that sort of drove me. Plus, there must have been something genealogically, I suspect. Because <laughs> I look back, I mean, I could have gone wrong a couple or three times. But I, I did okay. And I, but I, I did, you know, I look back, I was not a great kid. In fact, the report card said that one of my report cards said, any, you know, seems like a bright boy, but he's so mischievous we can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, every, we need people who make good trouble, right? And sometimes no, the no, mischievous I'm... ones, <laughs> the mischievous ones are the ones that do all sorts of cool, great things. Yeah. Well, very good. So, and we've talked about the victim mentality. Now, again, not to, to suggest that people aren't actually victims, bad no, things I mean, actually do happen. I mean, I, yeah. But, I became, you know, I, uh... the, when, 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 we, when we fall into the trap of ruminating on our victimhood, um, it really can cause a lot of challenges. And so sometimes that's abuse. Sometimes that's, you know, you didn't get the promotion that you felt like you deserved and you were overlooked for. Sometimes it's it's societal things. Uh, you know, right now in the U.S., there's a lot of sociopolitical kind of turmoil and we're very divided and 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 it, it's hard, you know, so maybe you're attributing it to some of those sorts of things. Maybe it was the pandemic. Um, lots of different things that can influence, you know, our perhaps sense of victimhood. Uh, how how can we retrain our brains so that we're not automatically just shifting into that victimhood, but rather we can start to move towards a, a resilience mindset? You know, you, you hit it right on, the, right on it because it's very important. You have to train yourself. When you get into a difficult situation, you do not think about that situation. Think about what's next because 
It's so important. And by the way, some cases the victimhood comes up because of your fault. I mean, I, yeah. I made some very big mistakes in my early company. You know, I could have said that the, the, my parent company made some decisions that basically caused, helped cause my failure, but it was my fault. And when it was over, I, you know, I gave the company back to them. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And I went on to what's next. And I found a young, I found a fellow who was a CEO of a major brokerage firm, gave me a job and was on my way. Now, on the other hand, when I was at Lehman Brothers, I spent seven years doing everything right. I changed two divisions. I, I raised seven and a half billion dollars in the second division in, in two and a half years. And they still threw me out. The, the boss and I didn't get along. He was a bad guy. But, and I could have taken, I could have gone to public because I was a chairman of outside boards and so forth. So I just cashed. I said, I earned a little, I learned a little, and I left. And I found my dream job. But I needed the energy that, that I might have used in fighting him to go on to the next step. I had to make the next choice. And I had to think about what I really wanted to do with my life. And that took a lot of energy. And instead of going to a fancy big firm like Lehman Brothers, I chose a very small firm because that was really what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to basically find a place where I could exercise my passions, establish my own principles, pick my own partners, and really plan. And so those are the things that are very important to people. And that, that energy you use, and by the way, I agree with you, you have just so much energy every day, every month. And if you use it in hating and woe is me, it gets used up. And then when you go on to the very difficult question of what's next, you don't have it anymore. And I think I, I can, I'm, I'm a real proponent of that. So, but I do believe early failure is a gift. And you do learn from that. And if you can just get that little trigger, that every time you come to an extremely difficult point in your life, that turn in the road is not the end of the road. If you can decide, you know, basically that there's something else over there. And by the way, in my case, each time I changed, it turned out to be a pretty damn good decision. And look, and I'm, I'm into the, unfortunately, the word synchronicity has entered my vocabulary. The, 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 uh, the, the Celestine prophecies that there is a sort of a, a flow to life. And sometimes the bad things that happen to you are good. They change your direction and send you in the right direction. That may be yeah, a little for, bit uh, Pollyannish, but I, I kind of look at my lifetime, I believe it. No, yeah. Well, I sometimes I think we need a little bit more Pollyanna in our lives. And uh, hopefully that reference resonates with listeners. That's an old movie. That's one I grew up watching as a kid. I think it was really uh, a movie from my father's childhood, probably. Um, but but it's one that always resonated with me. And and is life that simple? No. But it, part of it's just the mindset, right? It's just it's just choosing right. to to try to look for the positive in things, recognizing that yeah, things are messy. Uh, and I and I think you know, especially in this day and age of of, of just being so, so divided in society that we could probably use a little bit more uh, Pollyanna approach <laughs> in in what we do. When I was a strategist, for, for you know, and we got into a bear market, I always, in all my speeches with the fact that the world doesn't come to an end very often. And so if you look ahead, it always, the, the sun does shine the next morning. So I, I think that's very important. And maybe there is a signal that you're in the wrong place because something's bad happening to you. And that's why I think people should have to go back on a regular basis and dig down deep and ask questions. By the way, in our life, in their lifetime, junk people's lifetime, they're going to have to pivot a number of times. And here, look what I've done. I've pivoted away from Wall Street. To, you know, where Wall Street, I had a, a mantra which said, live happy is live hidden. Now I'm selling books or getting involved in communicating ideas. It's the opposite. I'm talking to people like you in a public arena, which I never did. At, for 50 years on Wall Street, because I thought that was a mistake. I thought that publicity on Wall Street was the next step before jail. So I, I stayed, out, stayed out of the press and stayed off TV. Now, you know, I, I have to go in that direction. So you, these people in our lifetime, because of the complexity of society, because of the longevity, are going to have to pivot a number of times. And you have to change some of your principles. You have to change. You have to recognize some other passions that you might have or that, or that develop over a lifetime. Yeah, well said. Ed, this has just been a real pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to need to let you go here in just a few minutes. But before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. That one, uh, my, I have a website, and it's a very famous name because there's only one like it, Ed Hagem, uh, www.com. Uh, and there's a web website that I think you can press a button there and buy my books, or more importantly, on Amazon, just put my name in and two books come up road on the road less travel very different than the road less travel and then of course my book the four p's 
the island of the four thieves, which is a fable. And I, I've written the fable because I think fable, fables over lifetime or, or history have basically a better way of communicating ideas. And going back to Aesop's fables, the God with travels, the Don Quixote, or today's Who My Cheese. I'm hoping this, this fable will allow people, well, the purpose of the book basically is to trap you into doing your own thinking. And I think it, I think it does. People have said that's what's helping them. They can relate to different parts of the book. So that's how to contact me. And I really appreciate it. I, I'm humbled by anybody who reads my book because there are so many books to be read. And I'd appreciate it if you do read it, to go to Amazon and give me a rating and a review. I don't have a lot of words, uh, other words, except for those in my book. I believe that you should develop a conversation with your inner voice early on and a vocabulary with that voice so that you can go back and look at different words. And I have eight words. The words are my four Ps. Find your passions, your principles, your partners, and your plan. But you want to put those into four buckets of life. Self, family, work, and community, which is my word for giving back. And basically, in each one of those realms of life, you want to for, for the four Ps. And in different parts of your life, you will focus on different parts of that those realms. First, you'll focus on self early on, then, of course, the family, and then work and, and community. And you'll find out one of the great mysteries of life, there's no such thing as balance. But by definition, in order to be successful, you must focus. Once you focus on one thing, you get out of balance. And the game is to have harmony. In other words, when you find out you're out of balance, you move back in the other direction. And of course, the work-life balance has been, there's so many books were written on it, but it really is. It's that case. When you realize you're starting to get out of balance, you have to move back. You, know, you take your wife to dinner more often, or you see your children more often if you work too hard. And of course, I think community giving back, you have to have that in your life, because that basically is what makes it all worthwhile. That's why we were put on this planet. And that basically is the greatest satisfaction. Uh, and in my book, I talk about just enough, and I think just enough financial resources is one of the things that I preach to my friends when they get just enough then to go on and be what I call community, which is giving back. And in my life, I've been being, being the chairman of board of trustees of the University of Rochester and giving scholarships to kids. I mean, when a little girl, woman stands up and says, you know, she's a, you're getting her PhD in optical engineering and she's a concert pianist and a concert violinist. And she says, it wasn't for you, Mr. Hajim, I wouldn't be here. I mean, what else is, it's not, nothing makes yeah. a bigger sound than that. It makes your heart yeah. pound. So thank you, Ed. It has just been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Ed can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.